porch making seeds Go and check my lettuces Go and check my beans Maybe a few nitrogen victim trees I'm so cheap Can't you see I'm saving seeds I'm saving seeds Cause I'm so cheap Kitchen counters are all covered with sloppy goopy tomato slop I accidentally spilled some I had to stop my wife from cleaning it up with a mop cause I'm saving seeds cause I'm saving seeds all this obsession is really killing me Actually, my wife, I would say, is more likely to kill me <laughs> because of all the seeds. I got seeds in jars, I got seeds in bags, I got seeds under the stairs. I got seeds in my hat, I got seeds on the floor, I got seeds almost everywhere. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad because I'm saving seed. Oh, I'm saving seed. Oh, can't you see? I'm saving seed. And I'm drinking nasty instant coffee. It's cold. How you guys doing? Let's see who's here. Finca, Amy K, Arkansas Woodcutter, The Domesticated Egg, Karen Hill, Amy K, Danny M. Alan Turpin, the bear barian, <laughs> the bear barian. <laughs> okay, that's good. Elizabeth Parker, David York, Lee Ngao. I don't know if I can say that, Lee. Lee Ngao. I think it's a mm. I got, Hopefully, I got that right. The crunchy Latina mama. Well, it's fun to say. Karen Garnet, or Garnet, Garnet like the stone. The beautiful stone. Oil science. Hey guys, Mama Woods. Seed shortage is coming soon. Yes, quite possibly. Hey Turka. Hand drawn bear. Awesome. Nice to see ya. <clears throat> so hey guys, I'm Jeff Schumann. Odd Rob. Hey, 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 hey. So I do not have a copy of the very best seed saving book. Um, very best seed saving book that I have ever read is Seed to Seed, Suzanne Ashworth. I own that one, but I do not have it with me in my tiny, tiny library right here. That is the set. If you had seen the library that I gave up, the library that I gave up when I gave up America, It would make you weep to see how far I've fallen. We have to do our very best to fit into a post-literate society, I suppose. But I, I, I had thousands, thousands of books, plant guides, you know. I had the complete set of Harvard classics, which I, I kept up there to make, make me look smart. Is I really gonna read all of Plato? No. <clears throat> But I'm just not really fond of philosophy, honestly. I, I like the histories. I like. I enjoyed the war commentaries of Julius Caesar. I liked Herodotus. I enjoyed reading Tacitus's uh, Annals of Imperial Rome. You know, I, I like that kind of thing. I like John Julius Norwich's uh, um, Byzantium trilogy. Very, very good. His history of the papacy was good too. Um, you know, I enjoy that sort of thing. But. Yeah, the philosophy, I uh, wasn't going to get around to it. And I tried reading Thomas More's Utopia, too, and I didn't like it. Um, Jonathan Swift, though, fantastic. But anyhow, yeah, all that. 
this 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 is my tiny tiny library. So I don't have all those books with me when I when you know when you when you you flee your the the land of your birth, the land of your ancestors, and you you go off gallivanting around like a rootless utopian or something. You leave a lot behind, but um, I still have a lot of the gardening books. It's just I just have to move them bit by bit when I visit, and we're not really getting visiting. Uh, it's not easy to visit anywhere right now, so. Um, Karen, thank you very much. Karen sends a $20 super chat with a, you are amazing and a dancing pair. <laughs> a dancing pair. <laughs> thank you. You're like, like the queen of super chats. The dancing pair. <clears throat> hey, Matt. Matt says, this is a good stream topic I've been waiting for. Cool. Bonjour. Uh, Lauren says, uh, or Lauren says, I got that book in the mail yesterday. So thrilled to hear it's the best. Yeah, it's, it's. Uh, Suzanne Ashworth is really, it's a very useful guide to seed saving. If you have anything beyond a passing interest in seed saving, it's very good. Um, yeah, David the Tumbleweed, it's about right. So let me, um, cool. Got the, the, the monkey ear and lead tree. Those are both very good, Amy, and they, they germinate pretty quickly too. Okay, so... I got this this morning. I, I spent the entire morning not in my office, but getting um, getting more work done because I, I did not get back to my my corn planting yesterday. I planted a round of corn with fish at the base of the ones that I planted, and then I had to go drive my son to work, and then I went right to the office, and I spent the entire rest of the day working, and I went home when it was dark. And so I did not get to plant corn, but it's it's important not to just plant a little bit of corn and then not plant the rest of the corn because corn requires pollination. And if you have like a little tiny batch of corn, especially the way I'm spreading it out, doing the corn in stations, um, and, then, and then you just let that go, you don't really get very good pollination. I needed a bigger patch of corn and I needed a better experiment for the fish. So I had to get back to it. So this morning we woke up, it was raining, it rained yesterday about four or five times off and on. It was raining again this morning, soaking wet, perfect day to go up and plant. My wife did some shopping in town and I planted. A couple of my sons helped me and we cleared more areas. It's really nice to be able to plant the corn in stations because you've only got to clear an area about that big for each four corn plants. So you, you clear your area about that big, you knock a hole in the ground, you throw something highly fertile into the hole, you cover it over it, you plant four corn seeds right into the top of that and, and that's it. So it's way easier than trying to clear the entire area down to bare soil and then, and then you know, having to, having to dig it all. And don't, I don't wanna do that. So basically you dig one area this big, you know, you got your little space and you just clear it of weeds. And then as the corn starts to grow, you just go back and you whack the weeds down around it occasionally. But what you guys saw I was doing in the video yesterday was actually putting in nitrogen fixing trees. At the same time, I was planting corn over fish, so it's a, double experiment so I I, um, I found that planting a moringa seed in each hill along with the corn worked very well the the corn would produce and the moringa was about that tall about the time the corn was producing and then chop the corn down and the moringa comes up so I, I planted moringa for chop and drops I have moringas all over the food forest area now from the first set of corn that I planted and even though that corn did mostly poorly I got a yield out of it, but it was only about a third of the yield it should have been because we weren't getting the rain. So even though we got, you know, um, very little on the corn, the the, uh, the the moringa is still growing, which means we're going to have moringas here and there, and they're really good nutrient accumulators. They're also a good edible. I'm going to use it for chop and drop. I call it the comfrey of the tropics. You know, can you have a hard time growing comfrey? You can get a huge amount of, of like regular chop and drop from Moringa. So just grow that instead. So since I already had Moringa in there, I, I got all of these different seed varieties. I've got uh, an Inga Lorena, which I picked up in the, the woods. It took me a while to identify which Inga it was. I knew it was an Inga. I knew it was edible, but I couldn't, couldn't find it. Um, uh, somebody commented and, and said that in Trinidad they call it Cockali. So that's, it's Cockali. Um, 
the the pods are like a tiny ice cream bean. They have a nice flavor to them. But then I also got some sort of a shade tree that has like cassia-like blooms and long spreading um, gra great green leaves. Looks really good. Put in the erythrinas. We got salmonia salmon. Um, like all of these, what could be massive trees, honestly, but they're, they're all mixed through. So all those nitrogen fixing trees, man, each one of those things, each one of those corn hills, at the same time, I'm adding in those nitrogen fixing trees, which I think is just so cool because I love it when you can stack, right? If I'm gonna go out there and dig holes in the ground, if I can double what I get out of that space or more, it's, it's, it's a success, right? Like I need to go put more nitrogen fixers out there so I kind of wanted to plant some corn too. There's still gaps, but if I can get a yield of corn at three months and then I'll be cutting and chopping and dropping at maybe six to nine months and I've got trees that are gonna last through that system for a really long time, I mean, it's fantastic. Anytime you can, you can, you could double duty, like we were talking yesterday about having your, your living trellises and putting in, putting in trees that you're coppicing and pollarding, using for supports. Um, this is this is really cool. Okay, I'm sticking in living fence posts from Gliracidia sepium. Living fence posts. So these living fence posts, they go in every like six feet or so, and then in between these living fence posts, I'm sticking in bougainvillea, bougainvillea, bougainvillea. So the bougainvillea are going in between the fence posts. So these posts. You jam them in the ground about a foot, foot and a half. The bottom of them roots out. Over time, they become little trees and you can keep chopping the top off and using them for chop and drop. But once they root, I'll string a little barbed wire on there. Then I've got barbed wire in bougainvillea and then the fence posts kind of hold the whole thing together. But my wife said, you know, you have to see this. Go look at the, look out there. You'll see there's a little, there's a little um, bird and his mate and, and, and these two, have been landing on top of those posts and hunting through the garden. So I look out, I look out the window, and sure enough, right, right there on one of those posts, there's this little bird, and he's going. Little cabbage moth goes flying by, and he's like, boom, after it. Whoa, look at that! So there was another thing. So I've got a fence post, I've got chop and drop. So I can use the, you know, the nitrogen tops to feed other things. So I've got a, a potential feed in place and I've got a fence post and I have a perch for birds that are actively hunting insects in my garden. I actually saw one smashing a grasshopper to pieces the other night. Like it had this great big one. It's almost like half the size of the bird. And it's just like smash, 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 bashing this grasshopper to bits and pulling chunks off it. Awesome. So there, we've got at least three out of there. Plus the fact that it's making nitrogen beneath the ground. So you can't, I mean, you can't beat this. If I just had a dead fence, right? Like I just stuck a post in the ground. First of all, I'd have to buy the post. Maybe put some concrete at the bottom. Second of all, the post is gonna rot out eventually. Um, it's useful to hold up the wire and the birds can land on it, but that's two functions. And it's going to rot out and it costs money. So if you look at the pros and cons of doing a living fence post compared to a dead fence post, you pretty much are gonna be on the living fence post side, unless you are potentially in a situation where you're not gonna be able to ever go back and prune you know, the top off. If you, if, you, if you don't like the fact that you have to go and chop those tops back now and again, well, then there you go. So, Robert, thank you very much. Um, Robert says a $5 super chat says, Hey, David, can't stay for long. Just wanted to pop in and say thank you. Your books and streams have made my garden much more successful this year. Very glad to hear it. If you ever want to send photos to share, I'll share them during the live stream. I think it'd be awesome. Um, but I'm glad to hear that. That's like one of the best things is, um, is writing about these things that I've discovered and then have people come back and say, it worked! You know, <laughs> what I don't want to hear is, it didn't work. <laughs> everything died. I followed your advice and everything died. But I never hear that, so I shouldn't worry about it. Okay, check this out. On the video, whoa, that is so weird. Scanning. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so on the video about nitrogen fixers and uh, planting the nitrogen fixers in the corn and planting it over fish, 
Carl Christensen says, I would love to see the difference at the end of three months between corn without the fish, but with the nitrogen fixing trees and vice versa. Well, Carl, I can't give you exactly what you want, but I did see that, okay, this is, this is useful because we don't really know if the corn is doing better with the fish or it's doing better because it's the rainy season. So he's very right in saying if we're going to do a scientific thing, like plant corn over fish, it doesn't really show us anything unless we have a control group. So I selected a kind of semi-random distribution uh, of corn stations when we were digging today, and I left out the fish. And I had one of my sons spray paint some rocks, electric blue, and I put an electric blue rock next to each of the five stations that do not have a fish in the bottom. So those are the control group. However, I don't want to just do nitrogen fixers or not nitrogen fixers because getting nitrogen fixers through the entire food forest is really the most important thing. I can play with that sort of thing later if I feel like it, but I don't. So somebody else have to do it. Actually, the nitrogen fixers I don't think are gonna be a net benefit to the corn whatsoever and probably will be a net negative because they're gonna be competing for resources in each hole, but I've, I've noted that, hey, look, it works with pigeon peas. Then I decided to try it with Moringa, it works with Moringa, so now we're gonna throw some Royal Poinciana's and some Erythrina's and whatever else in there and we'll, we'll see how it works. So, <clears throat> there we go. Anyhow, Carl, thank you very much for, for pointing out that it's a good thing to have a control. Okay, now I wanna show you guys something else before we get into the topic of seed saving. Check this out. Um, here we go. Do you see this? This is a fold out. This is two pages from my new book, Florida Survival Gardening, which was, this was just sent to me by the, the very talented book layout guy at uh, Castalia House, my publisher. And <laughs> <laughs> you, you, uh-oh, not controlling for blue rocks versus no rocks. Okay, that's funny. <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> All right, so if you see here, um, on one side we've got the longevity spinach, and the other side we've got Malabar spinach. I did these illustrations for the book. It actually took me... Um, almost as long to do all the pen and ink illustrations for this book as it took me to do the writing of the book itself. So this is, um, this is the, the, the two page part and this is part of the plant profiles, nutrition crops for Florida. And um, the book is coming out very, very soon. I think that the paperback should be out. Uh, he's telling me he should be done with it this week. So then it goes to the printers. And then I will announce it, but I'm, I'm just really thrilled with how cool it looks so far. Really, um, he's done a, a fantastic job, so. Uh, Domesticated Egg says, do you chop the Moringa all the way to the bottom? No. No, um, generally I've chopped the Moringa at like three feet for harvesting purposes. So you've got to stunt, you know, it gets like this tall and you take it down to three feet and then it makes some branches so you can come back and get more leaves off it. Uh, tends to be very columnar. It wants to go up to a certain point and then it starts to spread a little bit. So usually the young trees are just straight up. You know, they don't even branch for quite a while. But if you chop them at three feet, usually you get a few more that want to come out and, it, and you get more leaves that you can harvest lower down. The tree tends to drop leaves as it goes. So, you know, a young tree will have some leaves here and then it gets taller and it drops all those leaves and it gets taller and it drops all those leaves so you end up with this, this tall column with the tufts of leaves at the top. So if you chop it low, um, it comes back. You could chop it to the ground, but I, I don't see any need to. I find that they, they really came back better in, in North Florida after the winter when I cut them at a, about three feet tall and left them that big hunk of trunk that they could draw resources from. I'm not sure in the tropics how they would do if you coppice them. I'm always afraid of cutting too close to the ground because of the, the rot issues that may get into the inside of it. Um, I probably will play around with, with maybe keeping the Moringa at six feet. Wow, that was weird. Whoa, okay. At six feet, 
or so because that's what I'm doing with the nitrogen fixing trees, cutting them at, at just just like right around my head, maybe six feet, six feet and six inches. I'm six one, so I'll cut it just overhead so the branches are like coming out like antlers when I stand next to the tree. <clears throat> Time is perfect says we should be allowed to name all of David's future children. Sadava or Indica. I do I do um, yeah, my my children my children already appreciate their names so much. Little Gladitia triacanthus enormous is so cute. You know, we call her we call her Gliddy. Um, sometimes glitter. But Gladitia triacanthus enormous we thought you just can't beat that, the flow of that name. Um, little Piper Nigrum. Um, yeah, it's uh, Terminalia Catapa Termi. <laughs> hey, Biblist. Biblist. I don't know. You got to tell me if it's Biblist or Biblist. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. The Crunchy Latina Mama says, I'm in Central Florida. Can I start corn seeds now? No. No, too hot. Um, really? In Central Florida, you want to be planting corn in probably no later than, than February, maybe March. But February is better. It's really uh, because of the, the heat and the, the disease levels and the insect levels and everything that, be, that, that go up. Corn doesn't usually do well when it starts to get really hot like that. Unfortunately, I, I wish I could tell you something else. Right now, you're pretty much limited to um, black-eyed peas, yard-long beans, okra, hot peppers. You might get away with, with planting some boniato or some yams. Like and subscribe is the baby, right? Like and subscribe. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, Finka says, I name my children after plants. Little Bidens, Bidens Alba. Maybe not. <laughs> so, let's talk about seed saving. Now, actual content starts here. to see David, David the Good, we listened to Portishead, and drank spice rum. Welcome back everybody, it's the Good Stream, episode 120 on seed saving. We didn't just talk about a bunch of other stuff, so don't go back and watch the first bit. It's not interesting at all, You did, there was nothing, nothing happened whatsoever. There was nothing that you'll laugh at. There was nothing you'll enjoy. So start your watching experience right here. Do not go back. No, don't, nothing happened. So, seed saving. Uh, you'll notice that uh, in my gardens, I save certain seeds. I've saved lettuce seeds. I save cucumber seeds. I save pumpkin seeds. I say bean seeds, um, various various hot peppers, uh, tomatoes. I actually just planted a our second round of carbon tomatoes because carbon was the winning variety. So I saved carbon seeds and I planted a big flat of them and I shared some with my neighbors too. So my neighbors are also growing carbon tomatoes now. And I said, okay, well, we know that carbon did well through the dry season. So I'm going to save seeds from that. We're going to plant them in the wet season too and see how they do. No idea. Don't know if they're gonna like it or, or not, but that's that's how we learn. So that was the winner, so we're planting more. I also crossed white Thomasol tomatoes with Barry's Crazy Cherry. Now white Thomasol is a great big, very pale white yellow tomato with a, a tangy flavor at the front and then it, it changes into this great sweetness. It's like it starts tart and then the aftertaste is really sweet. I never had a tomato like it. It's very interesting. White Tomasol. So the white Tomasol tomatoes were not super productive. The Berry's Crazy Cherry made a lot of cherries, but then they succumbed to various diseases pretty quickly. But 
they were cool enough that we wanted to grow them again. But my, one of my sons said, okay, can we, can we cross these? Because he was reading Craig LaHollier's book. And he said, can we cross these? I want to cross tomatoes. Sure, what do you want to cross? Well, let's see. So he decided to cross Barry's Crazy Cherry, which is a small, crazy, prolific cherry tomato, kind of a little uh, egg-shaped tomato with a large white fruited tomato. So we took apart the flowers on Barry's Crazy Cherry, a few flowers, and we took white Thomasol pollen and, and crossed them early in the morning, one morning. And then my son put little strings onto the fruits that had been crossed, like right into the little bloom. He put a couple of little strings and we watched them and watched them and watched them until they ripened up. So those tomatoes, you know, the, the cross took some time. When they ripened up, we smashed them out into a pot and let the, let the seeds grow. And so now, out, out of that, we got about eight to 10 little tomato plants that all look exactly the same because they're a true, on, a true hybrid. They look exactly the same, they have, but they have broader leaves than the Berry's Crazy Cherry and they have really raggedy pointy edges. So um, they don't look like either parent, but when you, when you hybridize tomatoes, you get a very uniform hybrid first generation. The second generation is where all the crazy stuff comes in. So that's F2. We're on F1 right now where they all look the same. They're, when they now self-pollinate on F1, that's when all the splits will happen. We may get some large ones, some small ones, some yellow ones, some pink ones. We have no idea. So we have to plant all the seeds from these guys, well, as many as we can, and then see what happens. So this, the exciting thing is the next generation. This generation, we're going to get an interesting hybrid. Don't know what it'll be. It might be like a Roma tomato that's yellow. Who knows? It might be halfway in between. Could be anything. But the, the crazy spread of genetic drift happens in the F2 generation and beyond. So this is really, this is the first time we ever tried crossing tomatoes. I've, I've let pumpkins interbreed before, but tomatoes, this is a new one. But, um, you know, it was cool. My son said, let's cross them. Okay, great, let's do it. So now we've got this really cool experiment going on. Um, but generally, tomatoes are self-pollinators. So if you want to, if you have a variety that you really like, most of the time, it will produce true to type. And even if you are growing a, say, a Roma tomato next to large red cherry and you've got a Everglades tomato over here, they generally will go true to type because the design of the flower is such that the pollen on the inside falls down and pollinates the stigma. And so it self-pollinates. So it reproduces the variety consistently. These heirloom varieties go consistently unless a an enterprising bee just so happens to visit flowers from both of them and actually gets inside before they self-pollinate which doesn't happen very often but it does happen it does happen so you may not always get it to produce true to type but generally it's true to type so that's that's what's considered an inbreeding plant because the design of the flower is such that it comes back unto itself beans are the same way but beans are even harder to cross beans are beans have a closed flower that that the you know the insects don't get into easily at all and and they are a very strong inbreeder like their genetics don't degrade if they don't outbreed some plant genetics will degrade if they don't breed out regularly Whereas some of them can inbreed consistently over and over and over again, it doesn't matter. I mean, they're just they're just self pollinators. They they have a a very robust genetics that it's no problem. So like if you had one bean left in a packet of let's say Jim's Red Navy, right? So Jim's Red Navy, Jim's Communist Navy, Commie Navy, Jim's Commie Navy bean. Um, you've got one of those little you know jim's red navy beans left in a packet and you're like oh shoot those were delicious i only have one of these left but i'd love to save the variety because nobody's selling them anymore nobody's selling jim's red navy anymore so you plant that last seed and everything goes well cutworms don't eat it etc it grows you have one bean plant in your garden and it bears its little pinko pods and you break them over and you take those little commie beans out of there and they're fine. You can then take the 
30, 40, 50 beans you get off of that plant and go plant a garden bed with it. And it's not gonna be, they're not gonna be like little shrunken, weak plants or anything. Now, if you did the same thing with corn, you would have a problem. You would have a problem. Because corn is a prolific outbreeder. It is a wind pollinated plant. It's not, it's not an insect pollinated plant like, like a lot of them are. It, it drops a huge amount of pollen in the air with the breezes everywhere. Prolific, massive amounts of pollen. And so the corn, it, the pollen, each one of those little seeds on an ear of corn is a genetically distinct individual. And if they are too closely related, you get major inbreeding depression problems. So if you had a packet of corn seed, let's say you planted, um, you know, Silver Queen, Silver Queen sweet corn, and you said, I wanna, I wanna save seeds from the Silver Queen. Well, you got a packet of 20 seeds. You planted a little square foot garden with your 20 Silver Queen seeds. Those are going to certainly make corn for you that first generation, no problem. Nice little block of Silver Queen, and you decide you're gonna let some of them dry. So you have you know, an ear of corn, and it has maybe 200 kernels on it or whatever an ear of corn has. Look at that, I got all these beautiful seeds. There's a problem. There's not enough genetic diversity to maintain that variety. You could plant those seeds, probably not gonna do as, as much as the previous year, but if you save them again, like the next year, you're gonna have the most pathetic Silver Queen. They're gonna be like Silver Pawn, pathetic. Silver peasant, you know, copper peasant, lead peasant. Ooh, lead peasant. Yeah, lead peasant. All right, so you've got this, you've got a problem here because in order to maintain a corn variety, you need to have at least at least 100 plants. So if you're running low on a variety and you can't put together 100 plants, you better go find some seeds from somewhere else or cross it with another variety to make sure you ensure some vigor. Now you can save it for, for that, that first year with 100 plants, but ideally, even 100 plants is too little. You should have 200 individuals. So 100, they'll tell you, well, you can save from 100, but better would be 200 because there's a lot of crossing taking place and they really need the genetic donations from all over the place in order to make a, ro a robust variety and maintain a robust variety. There's a lot of problems with corn. Corn would be your extreme on one end. Beans would be your extreme on the other end. Beans don't care, man. Beans are totally solitary. Beans are INTJ. Corn is the opposite. Corn is out of control. Corn is the life of the party. Corn will kill itself if it doesn't have 199 friends. Like, speed dial, man. So, when you're saving seeds in the garden, you know, you need, well, you could get away with one tomato plant, no problem. One bean plant, no problem. On the other end, corn, no, man, you better have 200 corn plants. And if you're gonna save pumpkins now, Pumpkins, really, even though they cross quite easily, pumpkins, Finca asked the question, I will answer it. Can you cross your pumpkins with acorn? It's complicated. You see, when a mama pumpkin loves a daddy pumpkin very, very much. Okay, so you've got pumpkin. Pumpkin does not suffer from inbreeding depression to a noticeable extent for multiple generations. You don't really have to cross it. Um, there are both male and female flower, flowers on the same plant, and they just they can cross back and forth on the same plant. And you you'll get you can maintain a pumpkin variety with very few individuals, and usually it'd be fine. Probably get more vigor after a few generations if you had a few more you could add in. Like if you were just saving you know um, seminal pumpkin seeds, for example, if you if you have a seminal pumpkin, and you were saving it for like one one year at a time. You know, you got one plant one year, another plant the next year. It's like one plant, you save a pump, one pumpkin from one plant. Okay, that's probably not the best for maintaining the variety. You should go and get, you know, plant a few more. 
but uh, they don't they don't really suffer like corn does. With with pumpkins, if you want to cross pumpkins, pumpkins come in three main varieties uh, that you're you're going to see in the United States: cucurbita pepo. Cucurbita pepo has your uh, your delicatas. Um, it has your orange field pumpkins. It's got it's got you know multiple. Let's see, I think it's uh, yeah. Yellow squash. The Z, the Z word, the Z word. These, they, you know, so that's those are pepo varieties. You have Maxima cucurbita Maxima varieties. These are your nice old fashioned northern varieties of of winter squash like um the the, uh, the the blue hubbard squash golden hubbard there's quite a few very beautiful maxima pumpkins are very beautiful I, I very much like them but they they don't do so well in the southern united states uh, boston marrow is probably one as well let me see boston marrow is a really cool Really cool pumpkin. <clears throat> Let me see. It is a, yeah, Maxima. That's what I thought. So you get these, you get these really cool, pretty varieties. And your uh, acorn squash, your acorn squash is a, either a, either a Peppo or a Maxima. Let me see. I don't know off the top of my head because they never grow for me. <laughs> they always get killed. I think it's a, yeah, Pepo. It's Pepo. So, and that would probably be your turban squashes too. They're also Pepos. So if you're growing a Pepo variety, like say you're growing yellow crookneck and you're growing acorns, you could accidentally cross them. Uh, spaghetti squash, I crossed on accident with acorn before and I got acorn squash that had spaghetti interiors. That was really cool. Looked like an acorn squash, but you cut it open and it was spaghetti on the inside. It was an accidental cross. I just let them come up from the compost the year after I had grown both those varieties. And that's what I got. I was like, oh, this is cool. I should have saved seeds. It's really neat. It didn't look like what you would expect, you know? Uh, and then you have your cucurbita machada varieties. Cucurbita machada, the most famous one in Florida is the Seminole pumpkin and the butternut. So butternut squash is a cucurbita machada and also your tan cheese you know, your Amish style pumpkins, the, those classic tan varieties. There are some green varieties, but the cucurbita machada tends to be much more uh, vigorous and disease resistant. So if you're having problems growing Maxima or Pepo, you can grow cucurbita machadas. But if you are growing, say, butternuts and seminoles, they will indeed cross. A guy sent me pictures of his seminal butternut squashes and it was just ridiculous looking. Um, and some of your calabaza varieties from South America will also cross, cross with the uh, seminal pumpkins because some, I ended up with seminal pumpkins that had necks on them because I had a calabaza growing nearby and they crossed. So there you go. Um, it's, it's, no, stop saying the Z word, people. Stop it. House of the Dead Squash. So, <laughs> when you're saving seeds, if you if you have some, you know, some of your greens, those are those are generally pretty easy to uh, they're pretty easy to save, like simple to save. You just let them go to seed. If you have a few individuals, you're going to be fine for the first year. But I recommend like things like kale. Uh, you know, mustards, broccoli, you probably have 12 to 25 or so individuals because they do cross, they are outbreeders, they're not, they don't exclusively need to be outbreeders, but you'll, you'll start to lose vigor. And, and some of those varieties too, you got to remember that if they come from Brassica oleraceae, which a lot of them do, like, like cauliflowers and broccoli will cross. And, in, in, and you can get collards crossing and you can end up with weird stuff that's not really what you wanted. 
because a lot of our, our beautiful brassicas, our big, beautiful brassicas, have crossed and been, and been bred from a wild form to become these amazing things that we want, like broccoli. So <laughs> you can take a, a different form, a different something that's bred for something different, like Brussels sprouts, and you can cross it with your broccoli and then you may not get a good broccoli or a good Brussels sprout. You may get a lumpy broccoli with a small head or something like that. You don't know. I mean, you can experiment with it, but if you want to save, you know, if you want to save Alan, Alan Turpin's terrific broccoli and you've, you've got, you know, Hugh Brackett's uh, colossal cauliflower over here, they're, they're going to cross when you save seeds and you're going to end up with something weird. You're going to end up with like, like, Alan, Alan hates Hugh's stupid, weird vegetable, you know. You'll, you'll just Z it all up, man. You'll just Z that all up. You don't want to Z it all up. Um, you want to maintain a variety, uh, you got to watch out for, you know, what's the ancestry of the variety? Is it going to cross? You're going to end up with something weird. Um, you know, in, in the Jack Broccoli novels, Jack is saving a, an heirloom variety of Finnish turnip. And in order to save that heirloom variety, he has to make sure that his per regular purple top turnips, which are growing in an adjacent bed, do not go to seed. It's not that you can't grow them next to each other. It's just that you don't want them to go to seed next to each other so they don't cross. If you really want to maintain a variety and you have a mild enough climate and you wanted to grow two different things, you could stagger the plantings. If you have a long enough, mild enough, climate where it doesn't get too hot or too cold, some of these things you can stagger plantings on. So if, let's say you had a, you know, a Russian beet and you wanted to keep it separate from the Polish beet variety, you don't want them to fight, um, or you don't want them to, to intermarry and, and, and become something else, you could plant the one a month earlier than the, the next one and then you hope that they don't bloom the next time the next year or whatever, but it gets to be complicated. It's best to just stick to one variety if you're going to save seeds, unless you're dealing with an inbreeder. So if you've got your inbreeders, Right, so this is not insect pollinated. You got your inbreeding varieties, like your beans and your tomatoes. That's cool. Just save seeds from them. No problem. Don't even worry about it. It's not a big deal. Corn. If you plant popcorn and sweet corn and field corn, and you're like having one of these amazing corn years, and you're really excited about it, you'll notice different kernels of different colors mixed into the ears. So you may have popcorn and sweet corn kernels in the same ear, which is really confusing. So you can break your teeth on them, you know, or, and have some of them pop and some of them don't. This is weird stuff. You don't want to do that, you know, unless, unless you're just trying to make something cool because corn is really easy to make cool stuff with because it outbreeds so amazingly. You can take, you know, 10 varieties of corn and just plant different seeds all over an area and come up with a new variety of corn you know, in a few generations and just keep crossing it together. It's, it's so much fun. But you don't want to really cross something like a popcorn and a sweet corn because um, you'll, you'll end up with two types of kernels on the, on the ears, one that breaks your teeth and one that doesn't. You don't, you don't want that, you know. So you may be able to breed varieties, um, you know, for, but, but I, would, I would generally stick to... Um, I would generally stick to to sticking with, okay, I want to bre breed a variety of popcorn, get a whole bunch of popcorn varieties and cross them. I want to bre breed a variety of sweet corn, get a whole bunch of sweet corn varieties and cross them. Um, but, but if you start crossing between them, like dent corn and, uh, and your, your regular your northern flint corn and stuff, you can, you can breed a new variety eventually, but it's going to take some homogeneity of, of, of breeding and breeding and breeding, you know. Uh, Jason says, GMO. <clears throat> That's a good question. On the question of GMOs, there is this book. Okay. Let me, um, I'll read something to you guys. This is my book, Free Plants for Everyone. If you don't have this book, it's got all kinds of seed saving advice and it's got a lot of the information I'm talking about today, but with a ton of, uh, how to graft in simple ways and, and uh, how, to, how to propagate just about everything so you don't have to spend money. Let me read this to you. Heirlooms, hybrids, and GMOs. 
In the realm of gardening, there are a few topics more touchy than seeds. You'd think they'd be a safe area of conversation, but nope, not anymore. Not since GMOs came along and scared the pants off people. Now when I mention growing corn, I often hear statements like, but corn is GMO, or be careful. And it's not just corn. Heck, I've had people ask me questions about everything from herbs to roots. I understand the concern. I'm no fan of cutting and pasting genes cross species. In fact, I think it's downright evil and against the natural order. No one in their right mind wants jellyfish genes in their potatoes. Yet a lot of the concern about GMOs goes far beyond the plants, which are normally genetically modified. A gardener will tell you he only uses heirloom seeds as if heirloom varieties were a crucifix held at arm's length against an approaching vampire. I love heirlooms. However, they're not the only seeds unaffected by genetic modification. Most seeds are not GMO. I would even venture to say most gardeners haven't yet encountered GMO seeds. Yet a lot of people look sideways at the seed racks in the local store, assuming that the big vegetable seed companies must be selling GMOs to home gardeners. Fortunately, this isn't the case, at least not purposely. purposefully. George Ball, CEO of Burpee, was so tired of the rumors, he posted a public statement on the Burpee website titled, Burpee, GMO, and Monsanto Rumors Put to Rest. I and others at Burpee are asked occasionally about our alleged connection to Monsanto and whether we sell GMO seed. We have even been accused of being owned by Monsanto on the internet. I've decided to address these questions and false allegations formally with the hopes that someone out there in cyberspace may refer back to this post for information on these issues, straight from the source. For the record, I own W. Atley Burpee & Co. Burpee is not owned by Monsanto. We do purchase a small number of seeds from the garden seed departments of Seminese, a Monsanto subsidiary, and so do our biggest competitors. We do not sell GMO seeds, have not in the past, and will not sell it in the future. Another common seed company, Ferry Morse, owned by Plantation Products, released this statement from their CEO. We have been around for a long time and do not sell GMO seeds in any of our product lines, nor does our company plan to do so in the future. We do not feel the need to copy a few smaller seed companies by putting up signs on our retail displays because it creates an impression that other seed companies are using GMO seeds. The truth of the matter is that no seed company selling seed packets for a buck to two bucks to home gardeners could ever afford seeds that have been genetically modified, nor could I imagine that any legitimate seed company would jeopardize their reputation by selling such GMO seeds to the public. Now back to me. Those who argue in favor of GMOs often claim that mankind has been genetically engineering plants for thousands of years by selecting and breeding for desired traits. This is a lousy, lying, and misrepresentative argument. There's a big difference between breeding within a species and splicing in genes from other species. Genetic modification creates crosses that are absolutely impossible in nature. Breeding wild grasses into usable grains or selecting for the biggest blackberry bushes in the patch is natural. Putting bacteria genes into corn is not, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a quick look at what makes a seed an heirloom, a hybrid, or a GMO. And then I run over the difference between heirlooms and hybrids, which are controlled crosses, but not GMOs, and then GMOs, which are a actual cross where, where varieties have been spliced from something to another. It's something that would never ever happen in nature because it's impossible. So this is, um, yeah, the GMO sp seeds are expensive and the GMO seeds are, are uncommon on the seed racks. Now there is a problem with genetic drift because as we've said, corn is a prolific outbreeder. So if you have a patch of GMO corn growing next door and you're growing your heirloom Hickory King corn in your yard and they cross, they will cross, you will have genetically modified genetics in your next generation of corn and that's, that's not good. Obviously, that's messed up, which is why, you know, a lot, a lot of us say, hey, we're going to go out to the country and live simple lives. We'll go out to where there's some nice farmland. And then you end up with conventional farms all around you that are spraying chemicals. It's like you would have been less toxic inside the city, you know. Um, I wouldn't sell GMO seeds. And I don't believe in GMO seeds. So, but, but, but hybrids are not... GMOs, like the only way you can, uh, you know, it's, it's not like the only way you can avoid GMO seeds is to buy heirloom varieties. I only buy heirloom and people say, I only buy heirloom organic. Look at, it doesn't really matter if your seeds are, are produced organically or not because the tiny infinitesimal amount of pesticide that may have ended up on the seeds before you plant them 
from, from being grown organically. If there's any pesticides on there whatsoever because they were produced inside seed pods and chances are very low, you know, maybe there's a tiny bit on there. You're probably getting more toxins from the airplanes flying over and spraying chemtrails. Unbelievable. Is it okay if the plants, plants contain metachlorians? Yes, metachlorians, um, they surround us and yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. I, I talked to a local um, seed distribution point here and they said they didn't even have luck. They tried to get some GMO seeds, but they said they couldn't. They wanted to experiment with them and see how they grew compared to their local varieties, and they uh, they couldn't even they couldn't even get them because they weren't a big enough operation. <laughs> it's like, eh. <laughs> nah. Yeah, corn plants with round open cells. No, I don't think so. I, I think they usually they build them. They they plant. They have the varieties of corn that are uh, genetically resistant to Roundup. But what has happened is as they've continued to plant. Um, these varieties and sprayed more and more ra Roundup, the, the weeds have rapidly adjusted to the Roundup levels that are being sprayed. And so what they're, what they're actually doing is breeding Roundup resistant weeds. And, and when you spray pesticides for long enough periods of time, you, have, you know, we have been designed and nature has been designed with a huge amount of potential variability inside of it. So there's a massive library of genetics inside of each organism. These are potential things that could happen. When, when each of my children is born, first of all, I don't know if I'm going to have a boy or a girl. So there's a division right there. I don't know if they will get my wife's blue eyes or my brown eyes. I don't know if they're going to get my, my darker hair or my wife's lighter hair. I don't know if they're going to get my long, beautiful nose, or if they're going to get my wife's, well, more delicate nose. You know, I don't know. There, I have a little bit of a cleft in my chin. I don't know if they're going to get that. There is a birthmark that runs in my side of the family where there's one little mark right here between the eyes. It's actually, it looks like, almost like a little jewel was put there. My, my sister has it. Um, some of the cousins have it. It's very interesting. It's a, it's a repeating genetic trait. One of my children got it. Don't know where that came from. But you don't know what is going to turn up or not. Um, my, my, my underlying skin tone is slightly pink. My wife's underlying skin tone is slightly yellow. She has Cherokee genes. I do not. She has high cheekbones. You know, there's these genetics. We don't know which ones are going to show up. Unfortunately, some of the kids got my teeth. You know, they show up. So we don't know when a child is born, how tall they're going to be, what kind of foot size they got, if they're going to look like uncle so-and-so, or if they're going to look like grandma so-and-so, or great grandma, or they're going to look like something different. There's a huge amount of potential variation that takes place. And now when you have plants growing, and plants, particularly annuals, where it's generation after generation after generation, there's a huge amount of variation potential for generation to generation. We have these huge amounts of outcrossing, like corn, and, and things changing constantly. The environment that's around them changes how they respond to that environment. So if you plant a normal variety, let's say you've got, you know, uh, Missouri pipe corn, from Baker, Baker Creek's Missouri pipe corn, you know, Missouri Meerschaum pipe corn, right? So you got this pipe corn variety and, and it's been grown in Missouri. Now you take this variety and you plant it in Alaska. <laughs> It'd be really extreme. Almost all of them are gonna die because you don't have enough, you know, a long enough time for them to ripen up. But you might get one or two that actually gets set seed before the end of time. Now that's not really very good for starting a new variety, but you try it anyways, and you plant out you know, 500 the next year, and maybe you get 40 of those that, that actually produce early enough. You know, so this is, this is the way things, things can be changed and adapted to different climates. Because you know, popcorn didn't start out as popcorn, and sweet corn didn't start out as sweet corn, and grain corn, you know, dent corn, and flint corn, and, 
and 16 row corn, whatever else. These didn't start as these things, these were selected for these things. So there's a huge amount of potential selection that can take place. If you look at it as this massive amount, there's this treasury of genetics stored in each species that can be sifted and, and selected and moved to end up with really interesting and unique traits. For example, the genetics for variegation. You know, you've seen variegated plants where you have, um, it's, a, it's a defect where they don't have a complete amount of chlorophyll. So you have maybe yellow and white patches or stripes in the plants. It, it's a very beautiful mutation. You get this, this gorgeous look. That doesn't often or always pass on to the next generation. Um, but you can, you can reproduce that variety once you have it, generally through cuttings. Um, but you could probably breed for it over time. You know, just keep crossing back those, those variegated varieties so that becomes your main variety. So there's a lot of, of um, you know, it's a lot of very, very interesting um, potential that's, that's taking place inside of, of this, what you're, what you're, re you know, you're breeding. And so, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who I've talked about moderately often, he wrote the book Black Swan. He talks about catching a black swan. So basically opening yourself up to a potential for luck. So if you stay home every day and you watch television, the chances of you landing the career of your dreams or landing the man or woman of your dreams or, or doing much of anything, having anything interesting happen to you are very low. Also though, the risk of getting hit by a car are very low or dying of a plague is very low. You know, your chances of being um, stabbed to death with spears are very low. So, you are, are living a very moderate and, and not interesting life. Maybe you just, maybe you get a regular job. Your idea is, is you get a job for a company. Maybe you are, uh, you know, <clears throat> working at a meat packing plant. You get decent benefits, you get decent health insurance, whatever. You know, maybe that's just what you do year to year. Well, you're not gonna make a fortune at it, but you're gonna be able to pay your rent so you're living in mediocre stand. You're in, you're in mediocrity right in the middle. When it comes to plants, one of the main reasons I believe in growing fruit trees from seed is the potential for something new. The potential for a beneficial black swan event, an out of left field interesting thing that could happen, like a variegated Japanese persimmon. Nobody would have that. You could patent it and clean up. You could patent it for 15 years and graft that variety, sell it to a nursery or something. Make a million bucks. You could be the next Granny Smith apple breeder, you know? And they'll say, oh, you know, people have been working on these for years, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. A lot of the best discoveries happened 100% by accident. If you simply go to the nursery and you get a grafted tree, you will get exactly the variety you bought. You will get a navel orange, or you will get a Macintosh apple, or you will get an Alberta peach you will get the same thing that a million other people are growing. Sure, you don't have the risk that you get a sour variety or a small variety, but you don't have the potential chance of winning the genetic lottery by getting something that is just totally stinking awesome or so out of left field that nobody's ever seen it. You're not gonna get you know, how did the Macintosh apple show up? How did the Granny Smith apple show up or the Alberta peach or any of these? Came through luck. Somebody lucked out and then they kept producing that variety because it was so good. The downside of planting trees from seed is that you're just stuck 
you know, with seedling trees, that may not be as good as, as a named variety. So you take all the risk out of it and you let somebody else grow a named variety for you and graft it for you and then you take it home to your yard in Mediocristan and you have the same tree that's growing on a million plantations of trees elsewhere. Boring, boring, boring. The risk that you take by planting seeds is that you may not get something as good as the parent that it came from. But the potential reward of it is that you get something that's really awesome. Something that's really well suited to your climate. Something that's different. Something that's a cool cross. Something that, something that nobody else has. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's the thing. The downside risk is low. The benefit risk is very high. The, the downside risk of, of, say, quitting your, your regular job and going freelance, there's a higher downside risk to that. You could lose your apartment. You could, you know, you could fail. The upside of it is that if you succeed, you're your own boss. You can go, you know, telecommute from Fiji if you want to when you have to do work for somebody. So, you know, you gotta look at your upside and your downside when it comes to the plants and planting seed. The, the potential upside of, of planting seed is just really, really high. It's really, really cool. It's potentially amazing. And, it, and the downside's really low. It's like, what do you get? You know, so what? So what, you bred a crab apple, right? Oh, this apple, I, I planted it from seed. I waited six years and it was a crab apple. Mm. So, you've got a really good rootstock, graft something else on top of it. If you want to, you can always go get a piece of your neighbor's red delicious and graft it on top of there, you know? It's like, whatever, it's almost no loss. But back to seed saving basics, because um, that's a little more advanced. Fruit tree seeds, that's, that's like my, it's my favorite, one of my favorite topics. But if we go back to um, seed saving basics, when you save the seeds from your garden, I highly recommend, now you, know, you, know, you have to have a certain amount, you, know, you maintain varieties, watch out for your inbreeders, your outbreeders, and the ones that need a few individuals. Um, melons, cucumbers, squash, Pumpkins, those generally only need a couple individuals. If you really have something really sweet and you only have one individual, you could save it a year or two, probably fine, no problem. Um, but if you want to, say, save, a, save all the seeds in your gardens for the next year, then you're gonna have to get a little, a little more serious about your seed saving. You're probably gonna stick to varieties that, um, that are, are pretty consistent you know, you may not care that much if Scarlet Nantes and Danvers Half Long cross. Who cares? You know, you're going to get good carrots either way. I don't care. You know, maybe you'll get your own variety. Probably don't care that much if it's Detroit Dark Red Beet, you know, crossing with the, another beet. Unless you do care. If you really want to save it exactly to the variety, do it. But if both parents are good varieties and you just want to have beets in your garden, maybe you've got Golden Beets and Detroit dark red, you can just let them cross up, doesn't matter. Both of them are good beets, grow them, who cares? You know, let them cross, see what you get. Um, if you've got five different varieties of leaf lettuce, and you really don't care, you just want good leaf lettuce, if they're all good leaf lettuce, let them all cross. If one of those lettuces, so say you got a red lettuce and it's a little bitter or a little fibrous or something, you don't like it, cut the, the top of it, you know, chop it down before it sets seed and crosses with everything else. When they go into bloom, they're crossing, so don't let that one bloom. Maybe eat it in a salad tomorrow and then let the rest of them cross. But if you, you know, cross, cross your black seeded Simpson with such and such and such and such and such and such, eh, who cares, let them cross. Now the difference is if you want like head lettuce and leaf lettuce, don't let your head lettuces cross with your leaf lettuces because then you have no idea what you're gonna get and, and, it, and you may not get head lettuces again or you may get weird leaf lettuces or whatever. If you're trying to hold on to a type, at least a general type, don't let it get too funky. Just like if you let, um, you know, your, your Queen Anne's Lace, you've got Queen Anne's Lace blooming all around, and at the same time you are growing carrots, the Queen Anne's Lace is gonna cross with the carrots, you don't want that. Queen Anne's Lace is a wild, a wild carrot. So you gotta watch out for that sort of thing. You don't want it to revert to a previous variety, but if all the parents are good, good varieties already that have been bred to be good varieties, eh, who cares, let them cross, see what happens, you know? 
if you've got seminal pumpkin and butternut growing together, you don't care if they cross, both of those taste delicious. You know, you may end up with an improved butternut or a, a, a sweeter seminal. Well, whatever, who cares? Yes, eat, set, eat the bolty tasting ones first. Yeah, that's right. Amy K says, I have trouble with cucumber seed saving. The plant dies out from the humidity so early it's hard to get a good old fruit to seed from. Yes, I agree. I, I have had the same problem. It's, it's very difficult. Betty says, thanks, I came late. Missed that. Where can I get graft material? Generally, you want to join um, local gardening groups and find out who is the plant geekiest person you can meet and talk to them about cyan wood. You can also, there are online graft wood, cyan wood, S-C-I-O-N, cyan wood exchanges that take place usually every winter and spring. People trade things around. Yeah, the head lettuce commands an army of mediocristan. Yeah, exactly right. Um... <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, Ev, that's funny. I actually exchanged uh, emails with uh, Lois Bujold once. I was an early reader on one of her one of her books, Connection Through a Friend. Probably still have her email address. James says, "How far apart should plants be planted to stop cross pollination?" It's hard to stop the bees. If they are if they are wind pollinated plants, it helps to have wind breaks in between them, or plant them, you know, so so the wind isn't blowing across two two bits. So let's say if you had a hedge, you could probably plant corn on one half of the hedge, and then walk you know 40 feet past the other end of the hedge and plant more corn, and the hedge is probably gonna get a lot of it. It's not a, it's not a sure thing, but a little bit of space helps. With bee pollinated stuff, you can get crosses. Generally, I'd say if they're you know a couple hundred feet apart, you'd probably be okay. But that's bigger than a lot of people's yards. So if your if your neighbor is growing a variety and you don't want it to cross with them, you don't really have much you know uh, much option, many options there, unless you get out early and you actually pollinate before the bees, <laughs> so you know what you get, you know. <clears throat> but if you have if you have some barriers, like if you have if hedgerows around your garden, that, that can help a lot. Um, good, it's a good question. So now, when you save seeds, you go out in your garden, go out in the garden on a dry day. Seed saving is better on a dry day when things are dry. You don't want the seeds to get wet and soaked and then you put them aside. If it's not a dry day and you really have to save the seeds, Make sure when you bring them in, you immediately put them someplace to dry. Dry them as, as best as you can. If you have a dehydrator, like one of those Nesco nested dehydrator things, they're not very expensive. You can set them on their lowest setting and then run them for a few hours to dry the seeds out. Once you've dried the seeds out, um, I like to save them. I, I save them in mason jars or just in old salsa jars um, or in Ziploc bags and put the seeds in screw them really tight so they don't breathe. Once they're dry, screw them really tight so they don't breathe. Put them in the bottom of your refrigerator. I don't freeze them. You, some people save seeds by freezing, but in order to freeze the seeds, you really have to make sure that the humidity level inside the seeds is really low or else the embryo will be destroyed by the expanding water crystals inside of it. So you don't, you don't want that to happen. You want to get the humidity out of those seeds but if you dry them too far you'll actually kill the embryo so trying to get them to like freezer levels like the scientists do I don't even bother with that the, the two things that kill seeds are humidity and heat so the relative moisture in the air is a seed killer the regular moisture will will wear that seed out really quick and the other thing is the heat If it's hot and moist that's terrible if it's hot and dry that's better if it is cold and wet that's not good but if it's cold and dry that's perfect so cold and dry so you dry them out you put them in jars put them in in ziploc bags put them in your fridge they often keep a couple of years that way without any issues i uh, used to keep them you know in baggies or in jars in an air-conditioned dry room in florida and my seats were good for a year there 
but since I moved to the tropics, I can no longer do that. The, the seeds are usually spoiled after just a few months. Like I, I saved some seeds and replanted six, six months later, hoping to grow out this purple potted bean variety that I planted when I first got here. Couldn't save it. They didn't come up. Couldn't believe it. It's like, wow, they died fast. But you know, when, they, when it's almost 90 degrees and the relative humidity is almost 100%, that's not good for seed saving. That wears it out. You, you want it to be cool and dry, but not freezing. So you put your seeds aside. Uh, and and you know if you have a cool area, if you're in a cool, dry area, that's, that's great. You can keep them in your air conditioning in a closet or something like that. You're gonna have to plant them out every year or two to maintain the varieties. But otherwise, um, I like the refrigerator. You know, if you're a really serious seed saver, you can have a fridge all of your own. But I, I recommend, if your spouse does not want you to save seeds in the fridge, I recommend you compost your spouse. No, I don't. YouTube, flag this man. He's advocating violence. The word spouse is triggering. So if I put up, say, plastic along my garden fence, would this help keep the seeds from crossing? Yes, it would help to a certain extent, particularly for those wind-pollinated varieties. Unfortunately, bees will fly right over the top. So if you're saving something with blooms that are open and the bees go over the plastic, they will fly in the frost and they'll make you very sad. a spouse that says go ahead buy a second fridge for seed saving I think that's very important and I love you you have a very good spouse <laughs> Brussels sprouts Brussels sprouts okay <clears throat> Uh, Amy K says, David, what time of year should you plant and grow Seminole pumpkins? Myrtle Beach area. Well, I would, I would plant them, um, I would plant them after danger, your last danger of frost date, your last frost date, and not much after that, within a month of your last frost date, because it's, it's a, it's a pretty long season. It's, it takes, um, hundred and something days to produce pumpkin, so there you go. <laughs> Arkansas Woodcutter says, I have permission to buy a fridge for seed saving from D to the G. That's right. Tell your wife that I said you could have it. <laughs> Odette says, I planted three lemon trees from Save Seed and all is exactly the same fruit. Awesome, sweet, thick skin lemons. Good work. You know, some of those, some of those um, citrus varieties, particularly the less bred ones, um, they go, they go pretty darn close. Like if you plant key lime seeds, you get key limes. If you plant calamondin seeds, you get calamondin. Lemons, I wasn't sure on. I know you'll get decent lemons because I've, I've seen seedling lemons that were great before. So, <clears throat> Brian says, why are my mammy sapote leaves drooping? It's been raining every day and it's been growing fine. I, I'm hoping you don't have issues with something chewing it underneath, but sometimes you can get root rot. Like if it's flooded, that can be a, that can kill it. Okay, that's funny, Lordful. That's messed up. Seminoles grow through the summer, right? Yes. They, they like warm season. They don't like it super hot, but they like a warm season. Um. <clears throat> Well, guys, I need to run because I have a book to work on. If you didn't see it, check this. Oh, look at that. That is a, a overview, uh, double page from inside my new book, Florida Survival Gardening, which is coming very, very soon. I will announce it very, very soon. And, and it will be out, and it will be wonderful because I'm, I'm so happy. It's got 30, 38 pen and ink illustrations, I think, on the inside of it. And the layout guy is doing such a beautiful job. So... 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's that's just cool. Um, I want to play you guys a final song. <clears throat> Let me see here. This morning I found myself singing this song when I was out planting corn. I actually got up at 5.30 this morning. I've been getting up early um, and, and going out and working in the garden while it's cool. This is uh, a classic. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory, well we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky, but when traveling days are over, singing that in church when I was a kid. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Danny M sends a $15 super chat. Office rent fund. Yes, this office that I am in now, 375 US dollars a month. I've got great internet. I have a little refrigerator downstairs. I set up another computer downstairs so my son can work on learning programming languages. And, um, and and hopefully be helping me with some of my video editing and other things, which would be really cool. Um, Brant says, compost police. <laughs> I have to see. Oh, you're welcome. I haven't heard that him in years. I always liked that one. Um, Finka says, one day I will play the guitar. Finka, pick the guitar up after this stream and play it. That's how you get to do it. You can't say one day. You got to say this day. I will pick up bit by bit. I will learn it and I will do it. I will do it. Brant, thank you very much for the super chat. Much appreciated. Wait for it. <laughs> That's not 420. Oh no. I was I was behind a I was behind a bus on the road today and the guy had this logo and it was a clock and I'm like, "What time is it?" Oh, it's 4.20. <laughs> 17 minutes from now. That's pretty funny. <clears throat> I need some indoor plants here. You're right. I'm very happy with this tailor. I actually bought this tailor when I, when I flew up to the United States for my dad's 
funeral and my my I have a guitar it was okay it's not great it tends to go out of tune and I thought you know I've been playing junker guitars for so long I got a guitar with a crack in the top I got a guitar with two holes in the in the front of it where it had gotten drilled into by a previous owner to put a volume and a tone knob on there which are long gone and it has intonation issues and I'm like I'm a good guitar player and like halfway through my life and I've never had a decent acoustic guitar heck with it my dad just died one day I'll die too I need a good guitar <laughs> so I bought, a, I bought a good guitar I got it on sale MAE music MAE music in um, Fort Lauderdale <clears throat> So, my PayPal is, well, I'll put it in here. This is me, David at FordaFoodForest.com. Wait for it because you're singing about heaven. That's right, wait for it. <laughs> It'll probably be a little longer for me, but you never know. You never know, every day, every day is a gift. I'm trying to see if I have Compost Police. I had the, the lyrics for it. Um, come on, where is it? Where did I put that? I had it on my, I had it on my desktop. I had written this, this parody of, uh, Karma Police. I like that song, Karma Police, though. If I, if I play that song, it'll demonetize this. Actually, last time I played Compost, police um, they demonetized part of my stream which I like come on it's it's a it's a parody you can't do that it's a parody <sighs> let me see just a second uh, I'm gonna find something here for you guys I'm gonna see if I have a if I have a song. Oh, just watching, just watching this guy. <clears throat> yeah, here we go. This is another original called Nothing Sadder. That's, that's basically how it goes. That's, that's the whole thing. This is when I only knew one chord. You like it? There is nothing sadder than a man without his baby except a man without There is nothing sadder than a man eating a burger than eating it without a bun, without a bun, without a bun. In a world of pain and sadness and endless misery,
too much into that. Okay guys, you know, just don't read too much into that. There's no real psycho killer, you know, hope for violence or, uh, you know, violating nuns vows or any that kind of thing in there. It's just a, you know, it's just a song. It's uh, it's just one of those things, you know, we, we sing these songs, you know, like ashes, ashes, we all fall down. We might not even have any ashes and, you know, we might not even fall down, but we probably do because that's how it goes, you fall down, but you know, there we go. <clears throat> So there you go. Well, you guys, thank you for joining me very much. Um, you know, wait for um, Florida Survival Gardening. It's coming out very soon. I'm gonna spend the next couple of hours here working on the revised and expanded second edition of Create Your Own Florida Food Forest, which is gonna be absolutely stinking awesome because the original version was more like a Florida Food Forest manifesto than an actual full-on book. This book is already three times the length of the original and I'm not even, it's gonna be like, <laughs> or five times the length of the original and illustrated. It's gonna be awesome. So I'm, I'm really psyched about that. This is basically a, a labor of love for my Florida gardening friends. And I also have the, the next Jack Broccoli book almost done. I know I've been saying that for a while. It's, it's, there's a couple of things I wanna fix. I read it to my kids and they didn't like a couple of things, so I have to fix it. So you guys have a very nice rest of the day. Um, thank you all. Very much. Thank you to the super chats to uh, Brant and Danny, and I would like to thank all of the channel members as well. I'd like to thank um, Karen also for the super chat and Robert. Thank you guys for contributing to the rent on my new office, so I can actually do these streams. I'm hoping that this. It's something I can continue to do. Everything's up in the air right now. You know, this is a temporary situation. We don't know exactly if we're gonna be able to keep this or, uh, I mean, it's crazy. The, the whole situation is crazy. And it's, it's only been recently that I've been, even been able to get out of the house and move around again. So happy that I can be talking to you guys again. I appreciate the super chats. Thank you very much to the channel members that support this channel and keep this thing going. I see that also subscribers, we've passed, um, Past 90,000 this last week or so, so really cool. Um, anyhow, enjoy. Uh, until next time, may your thumbs always be green.